Islam tells us about rights, but at the same time tells us about limits. Always in Islam, if there's rights, there's limits to offset, so that you know where the limits are. Don't play with making something haram when it's not haram. If you examine what Islam really is teaching, and then examine what the condition really is. If we ignore reality, this is suicide. The person I'm trying to introduce you to you now has had, I don't know, the latest figure because the day before yesterday I knew that he had 1,800 websites, 1,800 his own personal websites. And uh, when I introduced him like that, he said he's gone to 1,806. So at that point I realized that overnight he bought six more Islamic websites and uh, he collects them like the way we collect our toys and things like that. So now, inshallah, he will be coming on stage. He will introduce you to some of his websites also. Please visit those websites. He has a stall downstairs where his wife is present and his daughter is present. You can collect his CDs and perhaps put some donation, inshallah, in the box downstairs also. Please welcome Sheikh Yusuf Estes, all the way from America. Wassalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in wa shahadu ila 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 Allah wa ashadu an muhammadin abduhu rasul ma'abai. This is a very special day. It's a day for the Muslims when we go for Juma, the Salah. It's also a day that according to Islam is more than just a little bit special. This is the day, Friday, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the very first human being, Adam alayhi salam, was created on Friday. Also, the day Friday for us is a day when we like to remember our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam more than any other day of the week. Because as we remember him and make dua for him, then this is something that is good for us and will really benefit us on the day of judgment, inshallah. So it's important, I think, to mention that Every Friday I try to remember to remind myself and all of the Muslims to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad. Let me hear you say that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fair. You need to work on that. Another thing that's important for us when we start talking about days of the week is to consider that we as Muslims today are living, a lot of us, we're living in non-Muslim countries. And that doesn't necessarily mean something bad, but it does mean something different. Whereas it is our, our day of worship where they have Sunday, and here we have Friday. So it's really like our end of the week, or maybe tomorrow the beginning of a new week for us, maybe, you know. So it feels kind of funny for us that this is our day, yet we still have to go to work. We have to do our thing, you know. A lot of times Muslims aren't able to get away from work to attend their religious duties. And that's kind of sad. So one of the things that we as educators, hopefully, Allah accept that promise, educators helping other educators and the presenters of Islam, one of the things that we should deal with, I believe, is some of the differences, similarities, and then the aspects that arise out of this for us as Muslims being in the West. It occurred to me that this was a great chance to deal with some of those issues. Man, I just mentioned one. Talking about Friday for us is what Sunday might be for Christians or Saturday might be for the Jews. Actually, there are some Christians, I don't know if you know this, there are some Christians called Seventh-day Adventists and they celebrate their worship on Saturday. They uphold the commandment in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, and also in the book of Deuteronomy, where it calls on them in their fourth commandment, I believe it is, tells them that they have to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, that being the case, 
that Sabbath, I don't know if you know what Sabbath means. Sabbath is from Hebrew, and it's very similar to the word Sabbath, which is in Arabic. How many of you know what is Sabbath? You know? It's the seventh number. If you said Wahid, Ithnin, Talatha, Arba, Khams, Sita, Sabah, exactly. So that would be number seven. For them, and they understand it to mean that that's the seventh day of the week. And they're starting counting with Sunday being number one. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, boom, Saturday. So that's why some of the Christians uphold that and still worship on Saturday. But coming back to us, here we are having our day of worship on Fridays. What should we do? And what should we do about the many things that occur for us with regard to our religion living in other places other than not, you know, in Muslim countries? So this for us is something that's it really is serious and at the same time it's not that difficult. It's a matter of understanding where you are and what's going on around you. For instance, I get a lot of emails on these questions and we deal with a lot. Somebody will write to me and say that I'm going to have to quit my job because my job is haram. And you're going, really? What's he doing? I thought maybe like he's selling pork, he's selling alcohol, you know, some horrible job. And I said, well, what is the job? I need to know. He said, well, you know, because uh, I'm working in an engineering firm. I said, well, what are you doing that's haram in an engineering firm? He said, well, we design, you know, cages and things for uh, boxes and so well, what's that get, why is it haram he said because they won't let me go pray on friday so my job is haram i said no the job is not haram the fact that they won't let you go pray on friday is the only problem you've got let us deal with that don't just quit your job let us let's see what we can do so a brother came to me with this kind of problem one time all we did really was to write an official letter on our stationery and send it to his boss. As soon as his boss got the letter, I got a phone call from the boss saying, we didn't know, we're very sorry, we want to accommodate religions, we thought he was just goofing around, the way he said that he had to go do something called guma or something, we had no idea what he was talking about. We didn't understand. We thought he was playing, but you know, please accept our apology, and whatever, if he needs the whole day off or part of the day, whatever you say, we, we don't want any problem. I went over there to his job site and I met with the man myself and talked to him and they were very accommodating. In another case we had a brother who was you know, working, he just got out of prison and we were happy that he got a job right away as an athletic instructor in one of the local youth groups, a Christian youth group. And then he said his job is haram and he wants to quit. And I said, why? You know, the, one, the last thing I want to do is see an inmate who just got out of prison quit his job because he's going to have huge problems and have to explain a lot. And so I asked him, what's haram about your job? He said, well, because I'm a swim instructor, one of the things I do is teach swimming, I have to wear a bathing suit and that's haram. I said, a bathing suit is haram for a boy? How? He said, well, somebody told me it was haram. I said, well, let's see. The bathing suit that he had does not reach his knees. We have something called the aura. You know the aura? It should be covered from the navel to the knees on the men all the time. It should never expose any of that area in between the navel and knees. I said, well, let me go talk to your employer. And after a brief talk, he said, oh, my God, if it's your religion, it's not a problem. You can wear a longer garment. He said, you can wear a pair of blue jeans. I don't care. Just, just be sure that it covers a uh, certain area too. They don't want to have something that, you know, could be a problem. So I said, no, this, this is all. We just want to be sure that it's uh, covering the proper area. And they were said, well, we know that a lot of people will wear blue jeans and they cut them off and the strings get tied up in our filters in the pool and it's caused a problem. As long as he'll hem it really good, we don't care. So again, it solved the problem. I'm giving you a couple of examples just for you to think about it. A lot of the things that we see as a big deal, a big problem, our youth also see as a big problem. It's not that big of a deal if you examine what Islam really is teaching and then examine what the condition really is. All too often we try to make a problem where one doesn't exist. And in other cases there may be a bit of a problem, 
but it's not near the size or the magnitude that a lot of people want to, to present it as. Let's look at another case. People will ask us all the time about music. I'm going to ask you to think about something. Is music haram? Is it haram? Or no? Or maybe? Or somewhere in between? And in every group that I address, I can get all of these answers. Some will say, haram brother. Some will say, no problem. And then another group will be like, well, sort of, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Here's something to think about. I want you to put this in your mind. When you think about our deen, Islam, as it involves us, with the law is our relationship with the law and Islam as it involves each other is our relationship with each other even though it's clear that the word means our relationship with the law because Allah has ordered us to have respect and give rights to others then it also is how we are with each other so our Islam is each other too Let's look at that and think about it. Islam is teaching us there's a balance. You want your rights, don't you? You want your rights. You want your rights. You want yours, yours. Everybody wants his rights. You want yours, don't you? I'm a citizen of such and such a country. I want my rights. You hear people scream like that all the time. You hear people also say that, you know, I'm a woman. Ladies say that, not men. Shouldn't say that. <laughs> they say, I want my rights, women's rights. Yeah? And men want their rights. A driver going down the road, he wants his rights. The driver on the right has the right of way. Is that it? So it's what we have in the States. So if you think about it, if all of us could have all of our rights, there would be a problem. According to me, what I want for my rights, and what you want for your rights, and you, and you, and you, and everybody, we would want more, really, than what would be in a balance. That's why Islam tells us about rights, but at the same time tells us about limits. Always in Islam, if there's rights, there's limits to offset, so you know where the limits are. Got that? And all of the things that we're going to talk about in this little lecture are going to deal with that topic, about a balance between what's rights and what's limits. Think about this. Allah says in the Quran, and it's real clear when he talks to us. So you hear it every Friday, this being Friday, I'll bring it up to you again. The Imam almost always will read this to you from Sir An Nisa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And then he'll read to you the very beginning of the fourth chapter of the Quran. In this, and most of you know the meaning of it, but I'll run over it real quick for the English. It's telling all the human beings, regardless if you're Muslim or not, to have respect and fear of your Lord, who created all of you from Adam, as we mentioned on Friday, and from Adam, his wife. So Eve comes out of Adam. She literally was a bone taken out by Allah and made into his mate. And from these two, Allah brought forth many men, many women. And then Allah says, and fear Allah. And he changes it from Rub, meaning Lord, to Allah. By whom you always demand your mutual rights. I want my rights. And that's our subject. That's why I mentioned that. Allah is the one... Everybody swears, when you go to court, for instance, you swear by God when you start out that you're going to tell the truth and you want your rights. Or you swear by God that you're innocent and you want your rights. Everybody is swearing by God and they want their rights. But very seldom you hear anybody say, I swear by God I want this guy to have his rights too. You don't see that. If you went into court, could you imagine something? Uh, they would probably think you were nuts to go in front of the judge and say, you know what, your honor, uh, my friend and I, we have a big dispute going on, but I want to be sure he gets his rights whether I get mine or not. I don't think anybody's going to say that, do you? Huh? I doubt it. 
Yet that's what Allah is asking us to do. Allah is asking us to give that kind of consideration in all things. So let's watch and think about it. In Islam, we have rights, we have limits, but all of these things have adjustments that can be made to them. All of it, except one. Allah is right to be worshipped alone without partners. This has no exceptions whatsoever. There's no exception to that rule. Always, all worship, devotion, thanksgiving, prayers, the salat, everything is only for Allah. Only. And there's no exception to that in any case. If that's violated, and Allah is clear on that, by the way, same chapter on Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, I think, is where you'll find Allah says, He does not forgive people to make partners with him in worship. A shirk, but anything less than that he can forgive. And that's what I'm basing my talk on, is that subject. Anything less than that, Allah forgives. And in addition to that, he also provides for exceptions to rules. Let's look at a rule, just so that we don't have to drag this on and turn it into a seminar. It's just supposed to be a short talk. There's a rule in Islam that we take from the Quran many times, where Allah says, harama. It's forbidden, haram, for you to eat laham khanzir, pork, pig meat, bacon, lard, or anything related to the pig and the pig's flesh. Don't eat it. Is that true? Muslims don't eat pork, and we know Jews also don't eat pork. We know that, right? What if there's nothing else to eat? What if there isn't anything else to eat and you will die? According to the Old Testament, I didn't find anything that allows that for the Jews. In fact, if they did it, they're considered unclean and they've made a big sin. They have to make expiation. They have to, you know, kick them out of the city for so many days or whatever. I don't know. But for us, if there wasn't anything else to eat and we ate it, would we be punished by Allah? No, because Islam is teaching us about the ruksa, concession that Allah makes during the time of durura, necessity. So, if there's a necessity in this case, no food, you can eat the pork, true? Yes or no? Yeah. And no sin on you, you don't have to make up for it, nobody considers you went out of Islam, you became kafir, no. You ate, and you can eat all you want until other food becomes available, yes? Just don't pig out. It helps if you laugh at these stupid jokes. I mean, it makes the day go quicker, okay? So, alhamdulillah. Now, let us consider some of the other things that are perhaps not as profound, but still, there's something there. What about music? We're coming back to that. Is it forbidden in Islam or not? How will we know? Let us examine another proposition that comes along from Islam which teaches us that everything in the world, the worldly matters, is open for you unless it is specifically forbidden. Got that? That's one side of a coin. Remember we said balance. What's the other side of the coin? The other side is that anything in worship, not the worldly matters, but worship matters, all of it's forbidden except what you specifically have evidence for on the other side. Got it? So you cannot make up some way to worship Allah and think that he's going to like that when he clearly made it very evident for you in the Quran with his statement, Al-Yawmul Akmatu Lakum Dinukum Wa Atmumtu Alaykum Nitmati Wa Raditulukum Islam Adina That statement of Allah says more or less to English on this day have I perfected for you your way of life often mistranslated as religion but it's your whole way of life and have conferred upon you nitmati, my biggest nama, biggest favor, and have chosen for you to submit to me in true and complete peaceful submission. Al Islam. So, therefore, because he said it's perfected, you can't add to it. Did Allah ask you in the Quran to make a special day every year to set aside for a birthday for Prophet Muhammad? No? Oops. Well, Allah also told us in the Quran, though, hold on, that we must follow the Prophet Muhammad, and anything he says, we have to take that too. 
which means to obey Allah and obey his messenger many times in the Quran you know this one this ayah is showing us very clearly that we call to everything right and righteous about Islam forbid anything that's not Islam or takes people out of Islam and believe in Allah but then watch this because it's in the same surah it says cool say and it's telling Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam how many of you memorized that one you know that one anybody what it says here say O Muhammad if you truly love Allah follow me then and only then will Allah love you and he will forgive your sins He's the forgiver of the merciful. Putting that into place and in context, all of this together adds up to what? We have to follow Muhammad Sallallahu And he's telling us, do not do to me what the Christians did to my brother Jesus. You follow that? Do not eulogize. Do not set me up as somebody to worship like the Christians did to Jesus. And he calls him a brother because he's talking about in prophethood, not a physical brother, of course. So now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that we shouldn't make a cross with Muhammad on it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, of course, we wouldn't do that anyway, but it's more, isn't it? I've heard so many Muslims say statements that when I went to check it out with the real scholars of Islam, it was so bogus that it was embarrassing to imagine that people would stand there with long beards and wearing, you know, their shawar kameez and stand up in front of a congregation, a jama'ah, and start preaching something, and then you go and check it out. And what they said was wrong. It isn't Islam. So, one of the things they will tell you is that the Prophet ﷺ is sinless. He doesn't have any sins at all. Have you heard this? Okay. And that everything he does, from the time he's born to the time he dies, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is absolute wahi, and there's absolutely no mistakes on his side. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. Now that means, according to the Quran, he's not a human being anymore. He becomes an angel. He's an angel. He's not a human. But the Quran clearly said that he is a human. And that Allah sent a human from amongst yourselves to give you this message. So now which way am I going to go? Am I going to believe the Quran? Am I going to believe this sheikh over here is telling me that the Prophet ﷺ is like an angel? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in wa sharu la ilaha illallah wa asharu wa muhammadin abduhu wa rasul ma ba'd. I've heard so many Muslims say statements that when I went to check it out with the real scholars of Islam, it was so bogus that it was embarrassing to imagine that people would stand there with long beards and wearing, you know, their shawar kameez and stand up in front of a congregation, a jama'ah, and start preaching something, and then you go and check it out. And what they said was wrong. It isn't Islam. So, one of the things they will tell you is that the Prophet ﷺ is sinless. He doesn't have any sins at all. Have you heard this? Okay. And that everything he does, from the time he's born to the time he dies, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is absolute wahi, and there's absolutely no mistakes on his side. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. Now that means, according to the Quran, he's not a human being anymore. He becomes an angel. He's an angel. He's not a human. But the Quran clearly said that he is a human and that Allah sent a human from amongst yourselves to give you this message. So now which way am I going to go? Am I going to believe the Quran? Am I going to believe this sheikh over here is telling me that the Prophet ﷺ is like an angel? He has to be able to make some kind of mistakes. Otherwise, why would he say Astaghfirullah more than 100 times a day? And why would he tell his wife that Allah had forgiven him for his 
future and his past sins if he didn't have any. It doesn't make any sense, does it? And then again, why in the Quran would Allah say to him, Abisa wa ta'ala, he frowned and turned away. If you know Surah Abisa, chapter 80, it's real clear that Allah is admonishing Prophet Sallallahu because he did what? He made a mistake, he turned away from a blind man who came to ask him a question about Islam, but he wanted to make dawah to these non-Muslims, and Allah is saying, never mind about them, take care of that new Muslim that came in. And by the way, that's a subject that we really are weak on today. And then in Surah at tahrim when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions the Prophet Sallallahu why do you make harma, haram, something which I didn't make haram? And Allah gets real tough on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi chapter 66 if you want to look it up. Because he had made honey haram, because he misunderstood, his wives were just teasing him, playing a game with him, saying that his breath smelled bad because he ate honey. Then it come to find out they were joking around playing a game, uh, he got a pretty upset about it, because, of course, because the law admonished him. But it was to teach us don't play with making something haram when it's not haram. And that's back to our subject, isn't it? Also, at the same time, don't make something halal that's not halal. What will happen if you do? Same thing. Why? We'll go back to the Quran again one more time. Go to chapter 9, Surah at -Tawbah. Look at chapter 9, verse 31, and see right there real clear what Allah is telling you, that the Jews and Christians took their rabbis and monks as partners with the law. That's what it says. So you know what happened? Shirk, exactly. They were making shirk. But Adi ibn Hatim, who used to be Christian, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu they don't do that. They don't, you know, they're not worshiping those guys. Prophet said, oh, yes, they do. He said, do they accept halal from those guys, but Allah made it haram? And do they accept haram from these guys, but Allah didn't make it haram, he made it halal? He said, yeah, they do that. And Prophet said, in that way, they worshiped them. This is why when you sit with the real ulama, the real scholars of Islam, and I have, alhamdulillah, many times in many different countries, I never found one real scholar whoever was in a hurry to give a fatwa about anything. I never met one who was in a hurry to say, Haram, brother! Halal, brother! And how many of you heard of Yusuf Karadawi? You know who's Yusuf Karadawi? Yes. He's probably one of the most well-known of all the scholars on the planet today. And although you may not agree with his rulings on things, I want to tell you a statement that he said. Dr. Karadawi said in one of his writings, that any of the scholars can make something haram, they could, you know, if, there, if there's a question mark is what he's talking about. If there's a question on an item, it's easier to say, uh, haram, brother, and stay away from it. Because on the day of judgment, then, you know, at least I kept you away from something, but it could have been halal, but I wasn't sure. He said, but it's real hard to say halal on these questionable matters, because what if it was haram? You follow that? When I was in Egypt, I had the beautiful opportunity to sit with a very knowledgeable person in Islam. And he doesn't like for anybody to give him any advertising, so I won't mention his name, nothing like that. It's just that I really respect all of our teachers so much, I can't help but mention at least some reference to them and ask a lot to accept it from him. But he gave me a beautiful statement in English that I never forgot which basically sums up everything I've said up to this point. Everything in the life that you go out here and do, in the worldly matters, everything you want to do, as far as the law is concerned, is halal for you, unless it's specifically forbidden. But everything in worship is totally haram for you, unless it's specifically ordered, mandated, or permitted by Allah and His Messenger. Now, some examples. And then I'm going to talk about some of the areas where we get confused. An example of worship that you don't play with. Everybody knows Maghrib Salat is how many rakah? Three. Yes, for Maghrib. Okay. Fajr. How much for Fajr? Two. No doubt, right? And how about Dhuhr? Asr. Isha. And you're from all over the world. You guys are from everywhere, yes? 
And we still all agree on that. It doesn't matter if they're Shiites from Iran or Diobandi from Pakistan or if they're whatever. All Muslims know this is basic. So if somebody said, you know what? I feel real holy today. Let me go ahead and double up. I'd like to pray four rakahs for Fajr, eight for Dhuhr, eight for Asr, six for Maghrib, and eight more tonight for Isha. Wow! Nobody would accept that, would they? What they would tell you? Go ahead and pray what's due on time, the regular way, but if you want to pray some extra, you're welcome to pray all you want to. Two by two by two, as much as you like. Yeah? No problem. So we see right away an innovation that wouldn't be acceptable. Like somebody who said, well, you know, fasting in the day is kind of hard for me, but why don't I fast at night? When the sun goes down, I'll start fasting. When it comes back up, I'll quit. Good idea. I can sleep through it all. <laughs> we do that through Ramadan anyway. <laughs> but we know that's not acceptable. We wouldn't do that. So these are some examples. Now let's look on the other side. When it comes to areas that are open, can we use a microwave oven? Can we drive a car? Can we fly in an airplane? Every time something new came, like an automobile, flying in airplanes, all these things, whenever something new came, Muslims ran to their scholars. They went to their imams, their mulanas, and they said, is this haram? And I don't blame them. It's good to go and check. It's okay to ask. Unfortunately, a lot of them said, yeah, it's haram. Telephone. Oh, brother, astaghfirullah. You don't know what's in that phone. Could be, oh, weird this <laughs> What is that? That's very backward. And this actually kept us out of the 20th century. Much of the 20th century came and went with Muslims still living a long time ago. Unfortunately, that's true. For whatever reason, I'm not blaming specifically our educators here, but that is a fact. So we see right away an innovation that wouldn't be acceptable. Like somebody who said, well, you know, fasting in the day is kind of hard for me, but why don't I fast at night? When the sun goes down, I'll start fasting. When it comes back up, I'll quit. Good idea. I can sleep through it all. <laughs> We do that through Ramadan anyway. <laughs> but we know that's not acceptable. We wouldn't do that. So these are some examples. Now let's look on the other side. When it comes to areas that are open, can we use a microwave oven? Can we drive a car? Can we fly in an airplane? Every time something new came, like an automobile, flying in airplanes, all these things, whenever something new came, Muslims ran to their scholars. They went to their imams, their mulanas. And they said, is this haram? And I don't blame them. It's good to go and check. It's okay to ask. Unfortunately, a lot of them said, yeah, it's haram. Telephone. Oh, brother, astaghfirullah. You don't know what's in that phone. Could be, oh, weird this, <laughs> what is that? That's very backward. And this actually kept us out of the 20th century. Much of the 20th century came and went with Muslims still living a long time ago. Unfortunately, that's true. For whatever reason, I'm not blaming specifically our educators here, but that is a fact. And today, now we're in the 21st century, and Muslims are all around the world. It's really eminent for us today to take the responsibility to learn what this deen really is all about and be sure to pass that on to next generations. Otherwise, this could cause a serious problem for Muslims in the future. Our youth, they have a right on us. They have the right to know what Islam really teaches. And they have a right to know how to think about the reality of where they live. I'm gonna sum up a couple of points. I didn't answer your question about music on purpose because I wanna keep your attention. But I wanna sum up with a couple of points. Today I visited with our youth here in the building and other places, and I asked them some questions. Our youth, by the way, are the best of the kids on the earth today. I love all kids, but Muslim kids are the best. They really are. Yet I found from them, the kids that I've visited with, as much as they would like to know 
nobody has really sat with them and given them the opportunity to pick up the real dean. We have our so-called Molanas and Khatibs standing on mimbars giving speeches in Arabic, Urdu, Bengali, different languages every Friday. And those kids have no clue what it's about. All they know is I got to put a kufi on my head. I have to wear some thing that looks like a dress. And I'm going to go with my father, my grandfather, my uncles. And I have to do this. But without a clue why. Then when they go to school during the week, unfortunately most of our kids are going to public school. Therefore they can't dress like that. Even if the school let them, they'd be laughed out of the building. Some of our girls, by the way, even though they can wear the hijab, when they get to their locker, they take it off and put on a ball cap or something else because they just don't want to be embarrassed with that in school and they have no idea why they're doing it anyway. That's a reality. And this is why I mention it to you. If we ignore reality, this is suicide. This is not a joke. There's something that's eminent in front of us and all of us are responsible for it. And that's why we're talking about this subject of educating our educators. Let me come to a couple of points and wrap it up. First of all, our kids are the future of Islam. It's not an option for you or me. It's our responsibility. Regardless of what anybody else does do or doesn't do, you and I both have to say, this is my responsibility. I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got. And I'm going to ask a lot to guide me and guide my kids because we really need this. Then we need to seek competent teachers who can communicate with our youth. I don't just mean language. I mean get down where they are and speak to them on their level. When I talk to our kids, I don't try to address them as a college professor. I don't talk to them about my degrees or how much money I made or any of the rest of it because this is, what has that got to do with it? What they want to know is, what's up? Or like they say, what's down with that? And I'm not sure which way to go up or down, but in any case, I try to talk to them so that they realize, okay, this is somebody that'll, that I can talk to that'll listen to me and understand where I'm coming from. The example that I used with a couple of our youth today was kind of funny. Because I was asking about the Quran and some kids that I know have memorized the entire Quran and we say, MashaAllah, he memorized the whole Quran. It's great. How old were you when you memorized it, Shay? Nine years old. You memorized it in Arabic, but you grew up speaking Urdu, yes or no? You can't even remember back that far. Did they teach you the meaning of what you were saying or just teach you how to recite? Just how to recite. And this is not the exception, it's the absolute rule on the planet. Even for Arabs in Arabic homes where they speak Arabic, they teach their children the Quran cover to cover, but they still don't tell them what it means. And I'm going to challenge every Muslim here today to think about something. That if you said you know the Quran, you personally, you say, yeah, well, I know the Quran, or I know some of it, or I know a little of it, I'll challenge you on one letter only, the first letter in the Quran. First letter is what? When you say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, what's the first letter? Ba. What does it mean? Do you know? Because if you don't know what that one letter means, how could you possibly talk about interpreting the rest of the Quran? Many people with all the translations that I've read always say, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Is that true? Now, I have a microphone and you don't, so I'm going to have to talk for you. I understand where you're going. Jazakallah khair. Now, ba, when you use it, depending on how you use it in a sentence, when you translate it to English, you have to consider, did you say like, bil lagutu arabi? In this case, you mean in the Arabic language. It means in. But if you say, for instance, anahibak um, filah, I love you for the sake of Allah. We don't say, I love you in Allah, in English, because it means like, are you inside of Allah? Audu billah, what's this? That's crazy, yes? So see what happens when you try to do a literal translation. It literally, it says, with the name of Allah, 
but you have to understand that in proper English you have to come up with in the name of Allah because when you're representing the king or queen for instance you say in the name of the king or the name of the queen you never say with you say in you then say well that's small well if it's so small how come nobody knew it except one person mashallah now if we realize that in learning the Quran and the interpretation of Quran is important then we're going to be ahead of the game and by the way they asked uh, Abdullah ibn Umar they asked him about memorizing the Quran and he had said something about just memorizing Surah Baqarah they said what you only have Surah Baqarah and he said yes we we used to only memorize the Quran as we understood it and put it into practice meaning that you don't just recite it for no reason so this is a point another point and this is where you're gonna throw me out and tell me never come back which is fine with me anyway but one of the things if we're going to get into the 21st century we need to go to every single masjid on this planet and you know that halal thing that we got that crescent moon on top of the buildings we need to cut that thing off why because it has no connection with Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam not one connection at all that represents a symbol of the Ottoman Empire that went down the drain in 1922 it's nothing but a sad reminder of something we don't have anymore and it makes people think we worship the moon. And even our own kids sometimes ask, well, why do we have that up there? Does it have some connection with the, you know, I don't know. And so we don't need that. Now I know I made a lot of people mad, right? Telling me my sheikh is saying the wrong stuff from the mimbar, telling me we don't know the Quran. Boy, I'm just trying to make sure that there's no way I can get back. <laughs> I'm destroying my bridge. Tell my bridge building, this is called blowing up your bridges. I'm the left. Music. Islam didn't forbid music. It didn't. What it did, it put the limit on it. And understand that's the difference. If you say music is haram, you have to have a proof. And there's none. But there's plenty of evidence about the limits of music. And that's where you have to go to the scholars and understand why we mustn't participate in these things where they're using musical instruments, singing songs that have wrong implications and also things that will buzz in your head instead of the Quran so there are serious limits on that but it's not Haram as long as you stay within the limits then what about smoking I take another one because I know a lot of people used to ask us about that they quit asking me because they knew what I was gonna say <laughs> question and a good scholar by the way you know what he'll do but when you ask a question he'll ask you a question back to ask you a question back because he needs to know before he gives you just a ruling do you smoke if the answer is yes do you want to continue or would you like to get away from it if I tell you it's haram is that going to help you stop huh because if it'll help you stop I'll tell you it's haram right now but let us find out why you're into this thing and then figure out what you can do about it but the ruling is anything that can kill you is haram can smoking kill people? I asked you. I didn't tell you. I asked you. What will happen? Well, you make your own decision. You feel better about it. I decided smoking's haram. I'm going to quit. Instead of, this guy said haram, but I'm going to go ask this guy and see if I can get a better deal. Let's go shopping. Fetwa shopping. Have you heard about fetwa shopping? Shop the internet till you get what you want. So, inshallah, some of the points that I made today, although open-ended, Maybe possibly in the future we can come to some more conclusions on that, but try to keep this in mind. That when it comes to worship, and listen to this phrase, the Imams use it every Friday, and you should be listening to the phrase in the translation of the meaning. When he says, And you've heard it and heard it and heard it, but how many times did anybody tell you what it means? The worst of all deeds are innovations into the deen of Islam and it means regarding those subjects and those innovations are misguidings and all misguidings lead to the fire of hell and may Allah save us from that I mean we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us nur the light of knowledge and let that knowledge spread throughout the Muslim community 
and raise up from you here right now, some of you, as educators for our Muslims. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us of those who put deen first and dunya later so that we can go to his paradise. Amen. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.